All right. Daniel's 70 weeks. Uh, last week um, was more of an introduction, and uh, I struggled through the entire time trying to get it all out of my mouth. I hope it uh, uh, made some sense to you. And we read through uh, the entire chapter of Daniel chapter 9. We talked about uh, the different questions we were going to try to answer, what we're going to answer uh, throughout this study. And I told you that there are seven points that we want to clarify in Daniel chapter 9. And we're going to be going through those. Number one is the captivity. Uh, number two is uh, the confession, Daniel's confession. Number three is the commandment. Number four is the cutting off of the Messiah. Uh, number five is the coming prince. Number six is the covenant. And number seven is the consummation. And I want to thank the Lord for making all of those um, start with the same letter. That worked out really nice. But if we cover all those seven things as thoroughly as we can, you should have a good understanding of Daniel 70 weeks. Now, I want to show you, this is the chart we're going to be working with that my wife was very gracious to uh, transfer to the board. And those watching on video are not going to be able to read the, the lettering. Uh, it just too, our um, uh, quality is just not good enough for you to be able to read. It's kind of blurred. But we have permission from Charity Baptist Bible Institute to create a PDF, uh, a PDF file that you'll be able to download and print the um, uh, chart. So you'll be able to go along with it. Uh, while we're studying it, you'll be able to go along with the chart right in front of you. And for those that are here, hopefully their eyes are still good enough to read all this. This is, this is Dr. Greg Gestep's chart. And I took this class back in the, uh, the Institute back in 1978 when he created the chart. So that's how old it is. And uh, it's, it's the only one that's really going to answer all the questions that a person would have about the 70 weeks of Daniel. So let's, uh, let's go on and jump on into it. Let's talk about the captivity. He said over there in uh, verses 1 and 2, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So when Daniel writes this, he is in captivity. And, let me get over there to my notes. Um... It's not going to be easy to understand this without understanding uh, why they're in captivity. The actual reason that they're in captivity helps explain the chart. So it's necessary to go over that. Uh, first thing to need to understand when you're studying uh, the Bible, the Jews are the very center of world history. And that, doesn't, and that doesn't, uh, does not just include the Old Testament, but it also includes the New so briefly, from Abraham to the Messiah, you have approximately 2,000 years of Jewish history. What's interesting is on the other side of the cross, you have about 2,000 years of church history. Still, when it comes to, you know, when I look for the news, you know what I look for first? I look for anything about Israel. Because even though this is the church age, when it comes to international history, believe me, they are the center of it. So always look for those things that involve them. Uh, a real brief uh, account of history, and I mean brief. Uh, for more, read your Bible. <laughs> but from Genesis 12 to Exodus 12, you have the calling out of Abraham, the beginning of the Jewish people. By the time you get to Exodus 12, he's called them out of bondage and out of Egypt. From Exodus 13 to the end of Deuteronomy, you have the giving of the law, and you have Israel's 40 years they sojourned in the wilderness. When you come to Joshua, uh, Joshua is when they're beginning to go in and possess the land. Finally, in obedience to God, they're going to go in. Joshua and Judges both uh, deal with them not only um, possessing the land, but getting every part that they're supposed to get. They don't actually get it all, but they, they, uh, they attempt to in, in some, some situations there. The problem, with Judge, or the problem you're going to read through Judges is Israel keeps backsliding. And every time she backslides, uh, you know, uh, she has to get right with God. 
And so God brings along a, a judge that uh, delivers them after they get right, but then they go right back into some type of apostasy. So from uh, the perspective of Joshua and Judges, they're going into the land, they've crossed into Jordan, and they're now starting to possess the land that God uh, gave them. And Ruth I include in there because Ruth uh, is about, um, it's about a Gentile bride. And it actually is going to document the line of Christ. You all know that Ruth was in the, the line of Christ. And she was a Moabite. And uh, just something that the Lord put back there just to show you that line coming through there. Then when you hit 1 Samuel, and we're going to go all the way, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. Those are six big history books. And they deal with all the kings of Judah and Israel. And it starts out being pretty simple. Uh, you, have, you have three kings over all Israel, uh, only three before the kingdom splits. The first king is Saul, the son of Kish. And according to Acts chapter 13, verse 21, it says, Afterward they desired a king, and God gave them also Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. So, um, um, Saul was the people's choice. This is when they didn't want, uh, they wanted a king to reign over them instead of God. And it shows their first rejection of God in the Old Testament uh, of, of him being the authority over them. Well, Saul reigned 40 years. Then comes David, the son of Jesse. And Jesse is Ruth's great grandson. And so David reigns, and he reigns 40 years. And this is in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. And the days that David reigned over Israel were 40 years. Seven years reigned he in Hebron, and 30 and three years reigned he in Jerusalem. Then finally Solomon, David's son, he reigns in Jerusalem 40 years. Second Chronicles chapter 9, verse 30, And Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel 40 years. Three kings. After that, the kingdom splits in two. And that's when you're really, your mind really starts being taxed when you're reading through. I'm not good with puzzles, crosswords, anything like that. So when I'm reading about all these kings, you know, and of Judah and of Israel, it's, it's confusing. I, don't ask me if I've got them memorized. I don't. But you're, you're all of a sudden you go from, you know, uh, Saul, David, Solomon. Now all of a sudden you've got two lines to follow and a lot of kings. So after Solomon in 1 Kings 11 and 12, the two kingdoms split. Okay? And the southern, the southern kingdom is called Judah. It only consists of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. The northern kingdom called Israel. So now you've got this kind of confusing thing. It used to be all Israel. Now uh, the northern tribes are called Israel. Sometimes they're called Ephraim. And you've got to kind of, you kind of, kind of go with it and... Look at the context of what you're reading. So the northern kingdom called Israel consists of the other ten tribes. Now when I mean they're separate, they're separate. They got their own kings. Uh, they got their own place where they worship. And they are separated completely. And, and sometimes they, they're even ready to fight with each other. Um, when Daniel writes, both of those kingdoms are in captivity. The Lord's fed up. He said, I've had it. Uh, the northern kingdom goes first into captivity. Those are the ten tribes of Israel. They go into captivity around 740 B.C. under Assyria, a king called Sennacherib. Interesting enough, Sennacherib is a type of the Antichrist in the Bible. And they go into captivity around 740. The two southern tribes survive a while longer somewhere close to about 140 years longer, they go into captivity beginning in 606. That's when they began deportations and deporting the Israelites into, into Babylon. And in no doubt in one of those deportations, probably the first one, Daniel is included. He is a young man, uh, still a very young man, don't know how young, maybe 17, maybe, maybe even younger. And he is made a eunuch. You all understand what being made a eunuch is? Okay. He was made a eunuch, and he is, in, he is in bondage in Babylon. So he's in captivity there. Now, the duration of this captivity in Babylon is going to be 70 years. 
And you find that in Jeremiah 25, 11 and 12, Jeremiah 29, verse 1, and other places, where it tells you uh, that when they go into captivity, they're going to be there for 70 years. Now, we're, we're going to get into why 70. Why not 170? Why not 7? You know? Why does God do the things he does, and why does he pick a number? Well, we, you have to find out the reasons for that. Now, let's look at one of the first reasons that God was angry with the children of Israel in 2 Kings chapter 17. I won't find that in the hymnal. 2 Kings chapter 17. And look at verse 7. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods, and walked in the statutes of the heathen, whom the Lord bur- uh, oops, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel, and of the kings of Israel, which they had made. In other words, the very people they conquered and cast out, they started worshiping their gods. I think the Lord proved that their gods were losers, don't you think? Since they conquered them so easily. <laughs> and the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God, and they built them high places in all their cities, from the Tower of the Watchmen to the fenced city. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them, and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols, whereof the Lord had said unto them, Ye shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah. Notice how they're separate there. Talking about both kingdoms. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I have commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by the servants and uh, the prophets. You have two types of prophets. You have pre-exilic, exilic, and post-exilic prophets. That means exile. Either before the exile, during the exile, or after the exile. Daniel was a post-exilic prophet. Obviously, he's after the exile. Jeremiah would have been a pre-exilic, well, he kind of pre and in the middle of it, but more of a pre-exilic prophet. He's prophesying before Judah goes into captivity. So when you're reading about these prophets, see, where the, see what time frame they're actually preaching in. Is it preaching before they went into captivity? And it could be a prophet to Israel or Judah during the captivity or after the captivity. Um, actually, Daniel's an exilic prophet. I take that wrong. He's in the exile. I take that back and correct myself there. Verse 14. Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks, uh, like to the neck of their fathers, and did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected His statutes and His covenant that He made with their fathers and His testimonies, which He testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain, and went after the heathen that were around about them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves. Uh, this is... a uh, this one uh, primarily is going to be talking about Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. And he's the one that brought about these golden calves that the northern ten tribes were worshiping. Remember them calves keep showing up? What, what, when's, the, when's the first time it showed up? Aaron. Remember that? You know how he said they threw all their gold in and this calf popped out? Why did they choose a calf? You know what? Y'all know what a cherub is, don't you? It's a calf's face. You know who the fifth cherub was, don't you? It was the devil. It was Lucifer. Now you know why they made a calf. As far as God was concerned, they were devil worshiping. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worship all the host of heaven and served Baal. You know, nothing like gratitude, man, after all the Lord's done for you. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire. That's where they're being burned up too. And used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke Him to anger. It's not like they're not doing anything. They're doing everything they possibly can to provoke the Lord. 
Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the, uh, but the tribe of Judah only. And I, I imagine when he's talking about there that Benjamin's included, I don't know. But uh, the, uh, J uh, Benjamin is definitely part of the southern tribe. Also Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel which they, which they made. And the, and the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of spoilers until he had cast them out of his sight. So one of the reasons, and I mean it's one because there's, the other one has a lot of weight too, but one of the reasons is they worshipped idols. And they were worshipping these strange gods. They'd come through these lands and see who these Gentiles were worshipping. Next thing you know, they're creating these uh, groves and uh, burning incense and uh, doing all kinds of uh, ritualistic things, you know, uh, 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 worshipping the sun and, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, you, need to, you need to pay attention, Christian, what they're having you do, you know. You'd be surprised how much pagan worship you're involved in. You just don't know about it. Pay attention. All right. Let's look at the, uh, one of the, the second reason of why they went into captivity. And this one defines how long they went into captivity. Look at Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26 and look at verse 32 to verse 35. Remember I told you that you need to have an understanding of the Sabbaths? This is one of them. And if you don't understand these Sabbaths and how God works in them, you're going to find out that you know, you're not going to understand why it's 490 years. In verse 32 he says, I will bring the land into desolation and your enemies shall dwell therein. If I got the right verse, am I in the right chapter? Let me see here. 26, verse 32, yep. Um, Enemies shall dwell therein, shall be astonished at it, and I will scatter you among the heathen, will draw you out after, uh, draw a sword out after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. Yep. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths. You see that? Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths as long as it lieth desolate. And ye be in your enemy's land, even... Then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest. Because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when ye, de when ye dwelt upon it. Look at verse 43. The land also shall be left to them and shall enjoy her Sabbaths. While she lieth desolate without them, and they shall uh, accept... Uh, of the punishment of their iniquity, because even because they despised my judgments, and because their soul abhorred my statutes. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them, to destroy them utterly, and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. And he goes on to talk about um, a, a time when he would turn to them. But do you see where he talks about these Sabbaths? He said the land, he says, as long as you're in captivity... The land will rest. Well, what you have, you know you have a, a, a weekly Sabbath, you know, Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. You know that you have a monthly Sabbath. Every seventh month is uh, Tishrei, and that's when they uh, celebrate uh, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and um, Taber uh, Feast of Tabernacles in the month Tishrei, the seventh month. Then they have the seventh year. You know what they were to do in the seventh year? They were to let the land rest. That means that they had to take six years worth of crops and keep a portion of that, and the seventh year kind of live off that. Now, maybe they rotated fields. I'm not sure how they did that. But if, it said, if he said, listen, on the seventh year, you let it rest, they never did. You know why? We can't afford that. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll just take, we'll just take all the sludge from the sewage treatment plant and dump it, on the, dump it on the land and keep on planting. And so that's what they do. You think these farmers out here, now there's a few smart ones that let it rest a year. But you know what most of them are doing? 
they're just throwing in fertilizers and keep on going. But you know what they're finding out? There's no more nutrients in the food. It's, 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 it's just sucked all the nutrients right out of the ground. You know, you think God tells you to do something, and then you think, well, he just wants you to do it because he just wants you to do it. Well, he does want you to do it, but there might be a good reason for it, too. He told them back there to do divers' washings with running water. <laughs> you know, what a waste. I mean, when you can have one bucket, everybody could wash their hands in the same bucket. <laughs> so somebody said, you know, I think there's some little bitty things crawling around on everything called microorganisms. And God had them running, had running water flushing away that. By the way, the Europeans came up with the bathtub. Will you bathe in your own filth? <laughs> The shower came from, from, came from the Jews. <laughs> they had spigots of running water. That's what that labor did. It provided running water. It washed things away from you. Anyway, where was I? For interrupting myself. Uh, look at Exodus 31, 13. I'm sorry? Exodus 31, 13. This is important if you're tempted to uh, become a Seventh-day Adventist, a Worldwide Church of God, or anything else that uh, involves you in Sabbath worship. In um, Exodus 31, 13, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel. Do you see who he's talking to? Did he say the church? No, he said the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbaths ye shall keep. Didn't tell me I had to keep them. In fact, Colossians 2 told me I didn't have to. And you, it says, for it is a sign between me and you. Context, children of Israel. Throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. Now that's not just written once, it's also in Ezekiel a couple times. That it is a sign between God and Israel. What? These Sabbaths. Now what's interesting is that God does things by sevens. Now if you don't believe that, just read through the book of Revelation one time. One time and you'll be convinced that God does things by Sabbaths or by sevens. What's interesting is that the word seven and the word swear in the Bible are the same Hebrew root word. So when God swears by himself, he sevens himself. And he says, these Sabbaths, they're a sign. Well, you know, a sign usually tells you something. When God created the earth in six days and rested the seventh. That's a Sabbath. He said it's a sign. What could it be possibly saying? Well, I, I don't think it's that difficult that there's going to be 6,000 years of human history and then a 1,000 year rest. Because if we have a weekly Sabbath and a monthly Sabbath, we even have a half-century Sabbath called Jubilee. And then you have a millennial Sabbath. It just makes sense. You think God's going to miss that millennial Sabbath? I don't think so. So he says those sevens, those Sabbaths, they're assigned to you. And... I mean, I'm not saying God took 7,000 years to create the, the heaven and earth. Those are six literal uh, days of 24 hours back there. But they're a sign. And the sign is 6,000 years of human history and the last day, which can be 1,000 years, that day is a millennial rest. When, remember, listen, when God tells you to keep a type... He wants you to keep it. And when you destroy it, it makes him angry. When, 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 Moses, when Moses struck the rock the second time when he was told to speak to it, God was angry enough. He said, you're not even going into the promised land. I might let you get a glimpse of it, but you're not going in. Why? Because you smoked that rock and I told you not to. He destroyed a type. And just as he destroyed a type that Israel was to speak to the rock the second time, instead of smiting the rock, which they did the first time, this is also a sign. And when they did not keep that yearly Sabbath, or that, uh, that uh, Sabbath uh, once every seven years, and let the land rest, they violated the, the law of Sabbaths. Um, you see how many they violate? 
490 years worth. You say, well, how'd they come up with 70 years of, of captivity? Well, for every Sabbath they violated, he said one year of captivity. 490 years, that's 70 of those Sabbaths. That's how we come up with 490. That's how we come up with 70 years of captivity. They violated 70 of them. In other words, it doesn't look like they ever kept the, uh, the law of Sabbath any time while they're in the land. Not one time. So he said, you know what? You're going to give me back those Sabbaths, and we're going to let that lamb rest. You say, why? Because you're going to be over here either in uh, Babylon or in Assyria. And we'll see if the land don't rest 70 years. That's how much they owed the Lord in Sabbaths. Now, turn over to Matthew 18 because it shows up in the New Testament in a weirdest way, though. Matthew chapter 18, look at verse 21 and 22. <clears throat> then came Peter to him and said, Lord, good question, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Now, you're going to see how magnanimous Peter is here. You know, some folks, you know, I'll forgive you once, but the second time I'm going to tear your head off. But Peter is so magnanimous. Peter says, seven times? Till seven times. I mean, he's, he's, I, I know Peter's pushing it there. You know, seven times, Lord. <laughs> I know I'm a very forgiving individual. But look what the Lord says to him. Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now, you know, you might think the Lord's just kind of being poetical, you know. And he wants to also make uh, Peter's uh, uh, magnanimous... Uh, proclamation look like he's a, a dirt ball, but there's a reason why the Lord said 70 times 7. Because that was the standard of forgiveness. See how so? He forgave Israel for 490 years. And then, and then the hammer dropped. He's telling you 70 times 7 because that's what he, that's the limit he gave himself. He said after 490 years, clobber him. Clobber them. So I've only got like 430 years to go. And then somebody's going to get clobbered. <laughs> or is it 490 times? Now there's some folks that are getting near that number. <laughs> if not gone over it. <clears throat> but notice how the Lord used the same standard he, he put for himself. He forgave them for 490 years, and then he, he brought their enemies against them. So he tells Peter, no, well, Peter's a little bit more than seven times. It's 70 times seven. <clears throat> now, that 490 shows up quite a bit. Uh, and I, I, I've given these some exact dates, but they're really, they, they can kind of shift a little bit based on who you want to begin and end with. But when, when, they, when they claimed the kingdom from Abraham to Canaan, I'm talking about from the calling out of Abraham to, um, to Joshua, uh, there was 490 years. Uh, 1920 B.C. To, 14, uh, to 1430 B.C. If that works out to 490 probably need to check my numbers there. And like I said, you can skew it a little each way. It all depends who you want to start and begin with, but it all comes out the same. Joshua to the kingdom is 490 years. So from Abraham to getting to Canaan land before they crossed the Jordan, at 490 years. Uh, Joshua, after they crossed over to the kingdom, that's all the way up to Solomon, is 490 years. Actually through Solomon. But then from Solomon all the way to the captivity is another 490 years. So those 490 years keep showing up, one after the other. And guess what the final one is? Right there. Daniel's 70 weeks. 490 years. That's what we're going to see. Now, I, now I've got to prove that and show you it wasn't 490 days or 490,000 years, of which we have a little ways to go. It's 490,000 years. <clears throat> I mean, one, one interpretation is as good as the other if you don't have the Bible to back it up, right? Say anything you want. Does everybody follow me so far about that Sabbath? 
why he put them 70 years of captivity? Because of 490 years, they didn't keep it. So he said, well, got to have those back. So that's why they're in Assyria. That's why they're in Babylon. That's why Daniel is a eunuch before King ba uh, the king of Babylon. In fact, at the time he's writing, it's the uh, Persians when he actually uh, begins praying about this thing. You know what's on Daniel's mind? How long, Lord? How long? Now you know where we're at. Israel has seen the zenith of their kingdom under Solomon when they were, I mean, the, probably the mightiest nation on earth, where the Queen of Sheba would travel the distance to come and, and see King Solomon. That's all over with. That glory, it used to be there were, that uh, Israel was so rich at that time that silver was counted as rocks. There was so much wealth in the land. And the, one of the things he told uh, Solomon not to do, he said, there's three things you don't need to multiply to yourself, you'll have plenty of. Women, one's enough. Horses, Horses, and those were from Egypt. He said, don't multiply a horse from me. There was something wrong with the horses. Don't want to get into it. And the last thing is don't multiply gold. Now, he's going to have enough, but he just, he just allowed it to come in to where, you know, it's like uh, printing too much money. You got too much wealth. Next thing you know, it's not worth anything. And the silver was, was actually worthless. There was so much of it. <clears throat> That's when they, when they rocked you. They didn't pick up rocks. They picked up silver chunks. And, no, I'm just kidding you. Anyway, now let's talk about Daniel's been in captivity all this time. And I'm not sure at what point, uh, how long he's been in captivity when he writes this. I didn't even bother to try to figure it out. But he's been in, he's been in it a while. He's already been through two kings of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. And now he's with a Persian king, uh, the Medes and Persians, not sure which one. But... Huh? Darius. Darius, thank you. And he's just down the dumps. And he realizes what, what Israel's done in causing this captivity, so he starts a confession. And when he does it is, he's confessing for the nation. You know, he probably wasn't even born when all this stuff happened. But you know what? He had to take responsibility for it. Listen, you may not have been born when uh, something happened to this country or when it began its downfall or it began to be crooked, but you're here now. And as Americans, we have to take responsibility for our nation. Now, I don't mind, I don't mind the president uh, pointing out some of our faults. I do have a problem with him pointing out our faults to a nation that's ten times worse than we are. That's what I got a problem with. Amen, sister. <clears throat> and you know what? Usually one apology uh, should, uh, and I think it's before God anyway. I mean, it doesn't really matter about the other nations. But one apology deserves another. I ain't nobody apologized to us, have they? About anything. And I guarantee you we've been more, help, we've been more of a help to the nations around about us than the other nations have been to us or anyone else. Now, if you don't believe that, you just go down and look through history. This has always been a benevolent nation to help other nations. Um, now, that doesn't help our present situation. It's too bad. Anyway, let's talk about Daniel's confession. You find his confession running from verse 3 to verse 19, but from verse 3 to verse 6 is the, um, is the part I want to talk about. And he says in Daniel chapter 9, verse 3, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Man, he's going all the way. If you ever want to get the Lord's attention, um, you might even try the sackcloth and ashes. I don't know if you can find sackcloth these days. You might have to go to an antique store to find it. But uh, when you fast and when you just, you know, just... Allow your countenance to, uh, you know, you're not sprucing yourself up and throwing on the makeup or uh, you just, you're just down, there, down there in the dirt just praying to God and fasting. Uh, that's what Daniel's doing. seems like whenever men do this, it changes things. The men of Nineveh did this and it saved an entire city. He says that I prayed, verse 4, unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord the great and dreadful God. Isn't that something? 
how we use the word, how the Bible uses the word. There's another word that says terrible God. Well, we get the word terrible from the word terrifying. And we get the word dreadful from the word dread. It's funny how you can make him a dreadful God that you'll dread, be full of dread because of him, or you'll be terrified because of him. But it happens. <laughs> it says keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Now, obviously, Israel had not. So he begins. We have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. In other words, it's, like, it's not like God didn't warn them he came to them over and over again. Turn! Turn! Because he told them, if you don't, you remember all them blessings I said I'd give to you? I'll take them away. You remember all the cursings I said I'd do unto you? I'll do them all. This was a covenant where each party was, was responsible to do the part that they said, yes, we will. They said, all that the Lord saith unto us, we will do. So what do they do? They worship false gods. They don't keep the Sabbaths. They don't keep... Well, let me, let me break it down for you. And then we're going to have to stop for the day. He said in verse 3, we have sinned. That means they transgressed the law. Sin is the transgression of the law. We have committed iniquity. That word, that word iniquity means a deviation from right. A gross injustice. We have done wickedly. That means evil in principle and practice. Starting to sound like America. We have rebelled. Resistance and insubordination to God's authority. He said we have departed from thy precepts. Those are prescribed rules of conduct or action. He says we have departed from thy judgments. Those are civil ordinances. Neither hearkened unto thy servants the prophets. Instead, they persecuted them. And Daniel's confessing all this, and he says, We, we, we. He's taking responsibility. The Bible says, doesn't the Bible say, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Daniel didn't even know that was written. He believed it. All right, we're going to stop there. We've got through the um, captivity and the confession. Uh, next week, we, we begin with the commandment. This is the important part where we actually start actually looking at the 70 weeks and the commandment of where it begins. This is very important that we establish the date at which it begins. Uh, we establish uh, uh, what, what, what is it going to be. Is it going to be 490 days, 490 years, 490,000 years? What's it going to be? And we need to establish that or it won't work. And it's obvious to see what worked and what didn't. It'll unfold right before your eyes. But, you know, have folks gotten it wrong? Oh, yeah. There's a fellow named Miller <laughs> that started calculating years when he should have been calculating days at, at, on, on one particular passage. And, of course, nothing happened. He thought the second advent was going to happen. Nothing happened. So he was a Baptist, so he dismissed it as, you know, well, <laughs> looks like I got that wrong. So you know what happened then? Mary Ellen White picked it all up and ran with it. Now we have the Seventh-day Adventist. No kidding. Took Miller's prophecies and said, well, he didn't come physically. He came spiritually. So they got the set date when Jesus came spiritually. And the Seventh-day Adventist cult is based upon a failed prophecy that got Daniel 9 wrong. Actually, Daniel 8, but we'll talk about that later. All right. Any questions about what we covered?